So let me now move to introduce our, our speaker today, who very kindly stepped up uh, at short notice. Um, she's Megan Black. She's a, a historian of environmental history and a specialist in political economy in the United States and the world, who received a PhD in American studies from George Washington University in 2015. She was a Doan Fellow with us at the Science History Institute back when it was the Chemical Heritage Foundation in 2015 to 16, working on the extensive materials we have on mass, mass spectrometry, which is a technique used to identify what chemical elements are present in geological context. At least that's the use uh, that Megan was, was interested in. She's taught at the London School of Economics in the UK, has finished postdoctoral research at the Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History at Harvard University, and she's now finishing up a research fellowship at the, Joan, the John Sloan Dickey Center of International Understanding at Dartmouth College, and will very soon take up a permanent teaching and research post at MIT. So her talk today is based on her recent book, The Global Interior Mineral Frontiers and American Power, published by Harvard University Press in 2018, which received four top from um, organizations that specialize in environmental history, international relations history, and Western history or American studies. So this is very much the best kind of interdisciplinary work where individual fields can still recognize themselves within it. So I will say a very big congratulations to Megan on writing such an important work uh, that addresses the role of the Department of the Interior in furthering US global hegemony through mineral prospecting. So Megan, we're really excited to have you here today and I will hand over right now to you to, to get going on your talk. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that wonderful introduction. And before I really begin, I do want to, to thank you also for the invitation and to thank Vince for taking care of some of the technological components of today's presentation. It's, it's great to be um, rejoining the community at the Science History Institute virtually um, and to kind of reflect on that time when I was working on um, research related to technologies of relevance to petroleum prospecting, which I actually will discuss a bit today um, in the kind of retrospective on the book. I very much look forward to your questions and your feedback. Um, so let's get started with a story. In February of 1967, Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, and his signature bolo tie embarked on a two-week journey across the Middle East. The tour included a stopover in Saudi Arabia, a place pretty far afield from the American West where Udall, a politician from Arizona, had famously overseen a variety of land use projects from hydroelectric dams to wildlife refuges. And although his stated purpose in the Middle East was to discuss the seemingly apolitical topic of natural resource management, including the creation of national parks, he simultaneously undertook activities that the international community had come to see as being deeply his main Faisal, or the modernizing leader of the land. Arab news media suspected as much. But to refute these accusations, Udall insisted with all too modesty that he was just, quote, an innocent minister of the interior who should be called minister of natural resources. The implication was clear. What could he or the interior department for that matter have to do with the politics of the world? Well, I use this story and this question to open my recent book, The Global Interior Mineral Frontiers in American Power, and I quickly answer that question with the claim that the Interior Department had far more to do with the politics of the world than has been previously imagined. Today, the Interior Department is an arm of the US government known for managing natural resources and stewarding the nation's parks, as well as supervising indigenous affairs. And its remit in environmental management, what 
I use to encompass federal planning for natural resource use and environmental well-being is widely understood to be confined to the home. However, in the 20th century, the Interior Department oversaw a quest for minerals across a seemingly disparate array of zones in indigenous lands, in formal US territories, foreign nations, the oceans, and outer space. So contrary to conventionalism, the Interior Department operated in a global field. And while this field had been staked out over the course of more than a century, Stuart Udall, as a figure in the 1960s, can serve as a sort of guide on a whistle-stop tour of the department's ever-expanding influence. So for example, during his tenure as secretary, Udall would not only venture to the Middle East, but would also supervise Native American affairs, as seen here in a photo op with a Navajo elder at the dedication of a coal-fired power plant on the reservation. He would oversee territories like Guam and Samoa because US territories had fallen under the department's jurisdiction since the New Deal. He would undertake diplomatic missions to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, depicted here in Santiago, Chile, where Interior had supervised natural resource programs since the earliest days of international development. You see the bolo tie once again made the trip. He would also manage the exploration and leasing of the continental shelf, which added to the department's jurisdiction a mineral-rich territory roughly the size of the Louisiana Purchase albeit one that was underwater. Here we see Udall is above water, looking casual on a boat off the coast of Puerto Rico. And he would advance a space exploration agenda that involved both the colorful attempt to mine the moon and more consequentially, the creation of a satellite that could view Earth's resources, Landsat, which I will discuss in greater depth. And here we see Udall at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and inexplicably, he opted for the standard black tie. Udall's world tour might signal for us many different things. So we might see in it the amusing but ultimately insignificant travels of a sort of self-styled cowboy diplomat, or we might see it as the benign export of American values and modernity overseas. I will suggest that we must see it as part of the offshoring of American power and environmental degradation overseas. So I want to proceed today as follows. I will chart for you the key coordinates of my research horizon, detailing how my first book contributes to the fields of environmental history in the US and the world centrally. I will first advance a key argument of the global interior that this department actually institutionalized a skill set cultivated in 19th century continental expansion that underpinned its storied environmental management, which I show in turn became a key mechanism for extending American personnel beyond borders in the 20th century. So we'll also see a process by which the department's mandate for conservation at home coincided with its expansion overseas and in those zones an abandonment of the environmental standards that it espoused. In the second section, I will reflect on how ideas about environment formed the basis for these US interventions. I'll argue that many US officials actually pointed to the borderlessness of nature, non-human nature, scare quotes, <laughs> as the rationale for a global project of extraction. And for these opening sections, I'll draw on material from the book with special attention to one case study involving the Interior Department's role in the creation of the Landsat satellite, which was a technology that helped in its first decade to reveal untapped mineral reserves. And throughout, I will underline the importance of understanding America's environmental management as having a relationship to and history to um, and connected with colonial dispossession. And that this history is something that has underpinned environmental governance, which, um, which is something that raises important questions for how to go about building environmental justice movements moving forward. So I hope that in our Q&A, we might have a bit of a, a reflection on, on what this history 
tells us about um, trying to create a more just and sustainable future. So with that, this leads us to part one and a contemplation of how this department's storied environmental management came to play an indispensable role in America's expansive unfolding. But another way of framing that problem is simply to ask, how did it, an overtly insular interior department come to have such a global portfolio? The apparent paradox of interior employees and exterior places is actually what had ignited my curiosities while doing my original dissertation research. Because I discovered in the National Archives that interior technicians were exchanging assignments from places in the American West to ones scattered across Afghanistan and beyond as part of international development, as I eventually learned. Initially, I found this to be a contradiction until, that is, I encountered a speech by an interior assistant secretary named Vernon Northrup given on United Nations Day in 1952. And in these remarks, you, um, Northrop explained Interior's activity across the so-called underdeveloped world by pointing to its history managing the American frontier. So let me quote him. Once it was the undeveloped West of the 1850s, which constituted a primary reason for the establishment of this department and conditioned its development. Now it is the underdeveloped areas of the free world of the 1950s. He continued that Interior had the quote know-how and skills needed to bring about the opening of this new frontier. So sources like Northrop pushed me further back in time to the very origins of the department in the wake of the Mexican-American War, a journey that revealed that the Interior Department had in important ways always been exterior. So this department had been born on March 3rd, 1849, to oversee America's continental expansion at a time when the federal government struggled to keep pace with rapid transformation, transformations tied to this development, including the proliferation of land claims in California following the discovery of gold in Sutter's Mill, the thing that precipitated the 49ers and the gold rush. Interior trailed behind the U.S. Army in this period, working to incorporate land expropriated from Mexico and indigenous polities into the U.S. national fold. The process entailed preparing the nation for capitalist utilization and settlement. And it was interior personnel who undertook the day-to-day -day tasks to subordinate this terrain and the indigenous nations with prior claims to it. So, Interior personnel oversaw the surveying, parceling, codifying, disposing, settling, and utilizing of land in the 19th century. In short, interior personnel facilitated processes that some would claim had brought about the close of the American frontier. This frontier concept is a very important one. Um, one that has been a nearly ubiquitous feature in American history and has certainly been central to many subfields that I claim as my own. So I'll take just a second to think about some of these legacies. One point um, that's fairly um, important in this discussion is an event that happened in 1893 at the Chicago Columbian World's Fair when the famed University of Wisconsin historian Frederick Jackson Turner introduced his frontier thesis. And this frontier thesis maintained that the United States was special and distinct from the European nations on which it had been modeled. And what made the United States distinct was precisely its citizens' special experience with the frontier, by which Turner meant a boundary between wilderness, or in his calculation, an unpopulated human, non-human nature. So, an expanse that did not entail Native American peoples in this vision, and we can talk about that. So on the one hand, on the one side of this boundary was wilderness, on the other, civilization, by which Turner and others meant man-made European institutions. And where Turner saw in this at the turn of the 20th century, a kind of distinct crucible for American democracy, Subsequent scholars, in particular of a critical U.S. foreign relations school in the mid-20th century, 
began to see instead a dynamo propelling America's overseas interventions. Put differently, US leaders continually sought new frontiers in keeping with a national appetite tied to materials and a national myth tied to expansion on this continent. It was in the crucible of this set of scholarly debates that the field of US environmental history was forged. Cohering in the late 1970s in the wake of the environmental movement, US environmental historians found other significance in the frontier. It's invitation to bring the material landscape from the background to the foreground in American history. So it was in this vein that one environmental historian illuminated the centrality of federal drives to conquer nature to the project of nation building. And this was a process that was especially evident in the dams and irrigation networks meant to transform the arid west into a patchwork of small farms in keeping with the Jeffersonian ideal. And we actually see this history romanticized and idealized in the mural that is on the screen here. This hangs in the interior department building and does the kind of work of celebrating this legacy while also minimizing the well-documented failures that accompanied this process, including um, violent dispossessions or attempts to alter climatic realities that have serious consequences and also asymmetries when it came to distributing, for example, water and water rights in the West. We can, we can discuss that kind of history. Um, but, but the frontier also then um, became a, an object of analysis for thinking about US politics and, and political formation. And a final group of, of importance to our conversation today in environmental history and borderland studies tried to challenge the binary of the frontier altogether, showing in very convincing ways that instead this kind of relationship was one characterized by hybridity of interconnected webs of human and non-human assemblages. Okay, so that was, thank you for indulging that kind of ground clearing to explain where my, my work fits in, in relation to established fields of knowledge around the study of American environmental thought and American empire. Because this is the critical foundation from which my work builds, but following interior officials' claims about their history and indexing the department's continual drive outward, I argue that processes associated with the frontier conditioned a skill set and knowledge of expansion that underpinned what often appeared as an exclusively neutral management of nature. And that this manifested first in Interior's renowned conservation platform and then in its environmental management of the 20th century. So Interior's know-how in turn would frequently be directed toward new projects of US global reach. And within the very multifaceted world of non-human nature, minerals in particular provided an important arena in which to claim expertise for a few reasons. In part, minerals had an increasing value to an industrial society more broadly, but also in part because another arm of the federal government was effectively seizing control over biological resources, the Department of Agriculture. But I think that even more significant than these transformations, minerals mattered because they provided new frontiers, those defined less by territorial limits than physical ones. Over and over again, the task fell on interior through bureaucracies like the Geological Survey and Bureau of Mines to pursue those limits. So hence, in 1899, after the supposed close of the American frontier, which coincided with America's imperial projection in the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, among other places, interior officials ventured to those territories straight away. And here in this picture, we see in the center on the left, one US interior geologist who immediately accompanied the US Army in order to survey for minerals and promote capital investment on the ground. What I show throughout my work in my many chapters is that interior department officials will continue this task in new zones and in new thresholds of American power. So let us now turn to the way this quest was oriented to the final frontier of outer space, 
as the interior department worked to create a satellite Landsat that would visualize potentially lucrative resources on Earth. And Landsat, I will submit to you, offers one dramatic example of how environmental management helped project American power further in the world. So, the 1960s, the United States jumped into outer space and with it went the Interior Department. Space exploration became a key pillar of John F. Kennedy's New Frontier, which championed government as a central mechanism for catalyzing America's social and economic well being. Within this vision, outer space became a symbolic canvas on which to cast hopes for shedding earthly limits and opening new pathways to future prosperity. Drawing on an expertise in precisely opening these kinds of pathways, interior personnel took on important roles in the space agenda. Interior geologists finally, um, or initially joined efforts with NASA to work on the problem of lunar geology, vital to landing a man on the moon. So for example, interior health, And they also undertook research on how to mine the moon, a kind of topical um, point here we might want to return to in light of recent political efforts to do similar things. But the journey skyward in that moment also had a boomerang effect with more important consequences. If technicians first hoped that the jump into the heavens might open up extraterrestrial frontiers, United States and Soviet Union vied for allies and resources as part of an ongoing Cold War competition. So here I'm going to talk briefly about the Cold War situation. Um, and in this history of the Cold War conflict between the US and Soviet Union, it's well documented that the United States used tactics to secure strategic resources deemed vital to the kind of military effort, but also a part of American post-war capitalism. So one well-documented tactic was the political coup in oil-rich Iran, in which U.S. officials and the CIA collaborated with a kind of multinational effort to overthrow Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953 um, to open up access to oil. Such interventions have drawn a lot of scrutiny in the history of U.S. foreign relations. However, the United States also relied on other tactics, some closer to the ground and far more inconspicuous, and these involved the U.S. Interior Department. Under the framework of American modernization and development in the Cold War, um, or what is also understood as this attempt to bring about social improvement in the so-called backward areas of the world, the department had been sending geologists and mineral experts overseas for decades. First, under President Harry S. Truman's Point Four program in the 1950s, and later under the U.S. Agency for International Development in the 1960s. So, in a, a kind of process that um, we know involved U.S. officials and experts going to foreign countries, helping to build dams and um, work on programs of animal husbandry and other education campaigns and public health campaigns, the, the kind of broader international development rubric, there was simultaneously a priority to target strategic minerals. And this is something my work helps to reveal. So interior technicians embedded in places like Afghanistan, Colombia, the Philippines, and Egypt oversaw an array of procedures long enshrined in their expansionism. They oversaw, as we see in this table, several tactics, including strategic mineral surveys, laboratory tests, mine mechanization, mine code revisions, and private consultations, which were meant to allow for the easier flow of getting minerals from bedrock to markets. So US geologists and mineral experts worked to create conditions favorable to extraction in foreign lands. And this process is one that expressly prioritized US needs and strategic interests over local needs. Um, and it unfolded with cooperation between the US government and corporations like Republic Steel, Reynolds Metal, and Standard Oil Company. 
In the mid-1960s, however, there was a challenge to the status quo of outsiders exploiting foreign reserves. And this was unfolding as the global decolonization movement um, created a platform by which many global South leaders could become more militant in seeking protection for their resources. So for example, they worked through the United Nations to establish control over resources, and some even founded the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, as a means to, to have more power over resources. In this climate, accessing foreign minerals became more difficult for interior geologists abroad. And as a result, some of these geologists vocalized a desire to bypass earthly friction to minerals. Specifically, in 1965, they called for a geological laboratory in space, which they hoped, quote, would lead to important new finds in unmapped areas of Asia, Africa, and South America. And this leads us back to Stuart Udall. Udall, as the interior secretary in the decade of the new frontier and the great society, learned of the agitation for a satellite from his geological survey director. And Udall immediately saw continuity between the proposed satellite and the department's history. In ways that were quite similar to Vernon Northrop, who I quoted earlier, Udall would say of the satellite, quote, it is here that the interior department with its observations sharpened by more than a century of resource investigations can make its most valuable contribution. We have the knowledge and background needed. Udall thus took measures to ensure that the Interior Department would have a lead role in this new Earth Resource Satellite Agenda. Udall particularly celebrated how the satellite would, quote, literally prospect from the sky. He added, quote, if we don't find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, then we may someday spot it from the rainbow. When Landsat launched in 1972, it became a vehicle and space a new pathway to convey the United States and multinational firms further into the mineral reserves of the world. Yet I want to shift here to a different problem, namely that Landsat has hardly attracted scholarly attention. And when historians have discussed Landsat at all, they often point to a modest legacy tied to its more recent role in tracking patterns related to climate change. No doubt a very good thing. But this does leave us with a problem. How did a satellite born to intensify mineral extraction on Earth become, or at least appear to become, an infallible environmental for crossing borders? In promoting the satellite, Udall put forward a vision of a borderless nature that required American experts to cross borders for the global and environmental good. This line of reasoning had actually been really well established in the Interior Department. Interior officials since the mid-century had mobilized similar ideas to justify the growing profile of the department in the world. So let us return to the endlessly quotable Vernon Northrop on United Nations Day, who had argued, natural resources, land, water, and minerals know no national boundaries. Like Earth, of which they are a part, they are global. This observation might seem straightforward or innocuous enough, but we must remember that national borders had become highly politicized in nations the very event that occasioned Northrop's speech. The UN upheld self-determination and resource sovereignty and was making it more difficult for outsiders to take advantage of different nations' resources. Nature in this sense helped interior and other officials to downplay political borders, but selectively and when in US interests. This desire is readily apparent in the cover of Resources for Freedom, an influential report on post-war resource scarcity that Interior helped to author. Now, when, when I first saw this orb, which <laughs> has become the cover of my book, I noticed that as it was floating in space, I could see no recognizable continents, let alone national borders. Instead, 
natural resources dominate, hydroelectric dams, atomic energy, oil derricks, mines, refineries, and, and so on, while, um, while national sovereignty falls entirely from view. Interior officials reasoned that resources belonged to everyone and that they would be developed by American experts for everyone. But this kind of um, universalizing claim also betrayed their unilateral extractive ambitions. And if we look at the same image, we can see a kind of inverse of that, where instead of global resources being the kind of end goal, we see the deterritorialization of the American interior, one that is in turn projected onto a global screen. In short, um, the, the kind of projection of American power in the world. And this leads me to a second argument and intervention in a US environmental history that's increasingly going global, as I maintain it should definitely keep doing. Many US officials in the post-war era cited nature as a means to blur boundaries and justify an expansive US power. Ideas about nature had long been important to US expansionism. And here, I should say that many historians have documented the way in earlier eras of So, so it's not um, so unusual that nature should figure into expansionist rationales. Instead, what I suggest is that these are changing rationales and ideas rooted in the seemingly obvious claim that nature was borderless offered post-war Americans a justification for a kind of intervention that might not trigger anti-imperialist alarms like those that were very much tied to the founding of the United Nations after the Second World War. And recourse to non-human nature was particularly useful because intermingling with the idea that nature was borderless was the insistence that nature was apolitical. And it was this commitment to a fictive binary between politics and nature that allowed Stuart Udall to make a plea of political innocence in Saudi Arabia rooted in the fact that he was merely a minister of natural resources. So let's now turn to the question I posed earlier. How did a satellite born to intensify mineral extraction on Earth become an environmental steward? Well, simply Landsat boosters built on earlier visions of a borderless nature to sell a new vision of a borderless and interconnected Earth, one in need of global environmental protection. So Stuart Udall would insist that Landsat would reveal the oneness of our total environment a universalizing vision soon popularized by this profound example of space photography, Earthrise, taken by Apollo 8 in 1968. So for Udall, Landsat would promote a global and environmental good. And in fact, many environmentalists at the time were calling for similar types of transnational action. And here we might think of Save the Whales, Greenpeace, and Friends of the Earth, Earth that would be founded at the same time. But Udall, as a representative of American power, celebrated this ecological vision at in nearly the same breath that he celebrated prospecting for minerals overseas from the rainbow. And this is a contradiction because the Interior Department and Udall himself within it understood well the latest scientific findings about the dangers of mining to local and global environments. The department had monitored oil and mining pollution for 40 years. And more recently, Rachel Carson's 1962 Game Changer, Silent Spring, in the 1965 President's Science Advisory Committee report on fossil fuel emissions were exposing extractions tolls on the air, earth, water, and humans themselves through the supply chain. And despite this mounting evidence, Udall, as the chief environmental manager of the United States, continued to promote an activity that had already become closely associated with ecological damage. And he did so especially in foreign spaces. And this is the kind of backdrop for then when Landsat launched in 1972, it would become less of an environmental watchdog than a favored prospecting tool of the world's largest oil and mining firms, especially the fossil fuel industry, including Chevron, Exxon, Bethlehem Steel, to name just a few. 
these companies represented an estimated one third of all Landsat users and generated um, investments amounting to one billion dollars within the first five years that can be derived from using Landsat images to identify new reserves. So Landsat's prospect, as I'll kind of end by, by talking about, was one that had been carefully chosen to allow users to see amounts of, of kind of breadth and resolution in which to identify geological structure, structures that were indicative of resource potential. And the way that this worked was that although certain geological structures foretelling resource potential could be difficult to see closer to the ground, stepping back allowed for smaller scale features like trees, wildlife, and humans to blend into the background while terrestrial features like branch faults, anticlines, and domes, domes were cast into high relief. So although Landsat could be and would be used for many environmental purposes, in its first decade, its first and most obvious talents were in furthering extraction. Only later would the Landsat imagery meaningfully document climate change, putting out fires that it once helped to fuel. And here I'll just end our discussion by reflecting on how this window onto the environmental institutions and ideas that linked the United States to the wider world will potentially resonate with more contemporary efforts to build a more sustainable and equitable world. As we see activists um, seeking to address anthropogenic climate change, attention to these kinds of histories might be important. History, first of all, can help us to understand the frequently occluded and multiple origins of the climate crisis. And for my part, I try to show the centrality of institutions of settler colonialism, to an environmental management apparatus that has continued to support um, expansion in other contexts. And it might help us to see how environmental ideas, though good in, in of themselves, can also be directed to different ends. Um, a point that's evident in the way the US policy establishment cited environment as a grounds for needing to continue an outsized role in resource extraction around the world. Um, so while environmental institutions and ideas have done much good, their capacities to facilitate a systematic push outward must be critically examined. Because in the absence of such critical reflection, this push outward um, will, in and through US environmental management, will not be disrupted. And in the process, the offshoring of the damages associated with those developments could continue unabated. So I'm going to stop there for now and open it up for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thanks, Megan. Um, such a clear and focused talk with um, some incredible images there. The iconography of the Department of the Interior, um, its political ambitions. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question from one of our library staff, Dan Sanford. He, he's wondering um, whether UDL's efforts to reach out to the use of extra national resources can be seen as a way to conserve national resources mm -hmm. and whether or not this connects with concerns about limited resources and spaces that UDL discussed in his book, The Quiet Crisis. Mm -hmm. Great, yes. Yeah, so, um, so I definitely see um, this connection between conservation at home and expansion overseas to be one of the ways that we can understand some of the contradictory behaviors of, of Udall and others, certainly people before him like Harold Ickes, who was an even longer serving Secretary of the Interior. Um, but it's also the case that Udall was very closely aligned with oil and mining industries at home. And as much as you know, the, the quiet crisis could point fingers at industrialization or, or population growth was another big concern was as we would become more and more aware of the sort of introduction of carbon into the atmosphere in ways that had um, global ramifications. So one way we can see Udall's work closer to home is in places like Navajo Reservation, 
or offshore. And he oversaw an offshore leasing bonanza in 1967 that culminated in $1.5 billion worth of revenue and allowed a proliferation of oil and oil firms in particular to dig up, you know, and, and drill the ocean floor. And this is actually the story behind the Santa Barbara oil spill, which shows that although I, I absolutely do see this kind of push outward on behalf of interior secretaries out of a kind of conservation at home ethos, there are ways in which that also falls apart when you look at the kind of proximity of these figures to the oil and mining industry. And that has a much longer history. It really does come back to earlier phases of settler colonialism when the Interior Department oversaw both um, natural resources and the subjugation of indigenous populations as well. It's been a, a constant kind of motif in, in institutional history. So speaking of that longer history, actually, um, one of our audience members, Evan Bonney, was asking you um, if you could elaborate a bit more on how a 19th century concept morph to influence the U.S. executive politics in the 1950s? Mm -hmm. Right, well, I, I think you firstly see the way that that institutional memory shores up their kind of sense of purpose and belonging. And I think of things like, you know, the many pictures I could see of Harold Ickes and other interior secretaries standing in front of murals that show covered wagons and imagine the kind of earlier history of the department in facilitating westward expansion, but that's more of like a symbolic kind. And I think that the question also is trying to understand maybe the more like logistical and technical aspects that get sort of, you know, repurposed over time. But yeah. one way that I see this kind of influence is even at the level of bibliographical citation, right? So U.S. geologists were constantly referring to knowledge produced in and through the process of American westward expansion. I mean, what else would they be citing? These were the zones of exploration and reconnaissance that had sort of cultivated a way of, of knowing how to um, assess the kind of mineral content of different geological features. But, um, but these also have ways of sort of easily justifying why the interior geologists were suddenly in Bolivia. So for example, the geologists who were in 1941 and 42 as part of the Second World War, I have a chapter on Latin America when, um, when geologists transfer kind of skills from both their own involvement in the American West and cite reports from earlier 19th century incursions in the American West, which was um, very much in a space of becoming rather than like a, a clearly demarcated one in that time as influencing the way that they do their work. And um, the process of, of surveying and parceling are also taken to the continental shelf to kind of look at a very practical way that the skill set of what is done on the continent then gets transferred to submerged lands. And the parceling of the continental shelf well, a kind of bonanza, and that's the actual language that they use to describe it when, um, when these kinds of um, public domains are then privatized through the kind of, or partially privatized by allowing companies like um, Atlantic Richfield companies, so like Arco or Exxon or whatnot to, to extract and utilize land. But it's really uncritical. People sometimes are, are recognizing the kind of echoes of former methodologies and present practices. And sometimes it's just a thing that has been passed on from generation to generation without any sense of, of history to it. So, so there are both symbolic and kind of technical, like um, more methodological ways that this skill set um, morphs over time while also retaining certain kinds of um, expansive comportments. So I, I, mean, I had a question that related to this actually, just on the, um, the kind of training and institutional side. Mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of replicating that skill set, like the actual training involved, um, what's the kind of public private um, link there? Is the training all done by the Department of the Interior or um, what kind of like public private partnerships are happening and did that change over the long durée? Right. Well, I think 
a very important point that your question gets to is that there's a highly permeable boundary between public and private. Company geologists can move into appointed positions in the Bureau of Mines and Geological Survey, as was the case of director of the Bureau of Mines, James Boyd, who would be a Kennecott Copper head and then a, a regulatory, quote unquote, you know, US government official who then would return to a company payroll after his stint, which is very common to this day. Um, and the training also could happen as much of it did in places like Colorado School of Mines or Princeton or, or other kinds of academic spaces. Um, so it's not an exclusive purview, but I think that that kind of permeability helps to explain the, the actually fairly collegial set of relations between the private sector and the geological survey. Now that's not uniform. And when the geological survey was founded in 1879, Louis um, Agassiz was very opposed to a kind of government arm that could that would oversee functions better done by private industry, though later Agassiz and others were very content to benefit from the copious geological survey reports in the US, but also of the world. Um, so so the, the kind of um, mindset, I think, is one that government should take on a role promoting the interests of private firms. And that fits, that actually rests a little bit uncomfortably alongside an assumption that we often have or that we see um, put forward in like kind of political discourse to this day that mining firms and mining companies in particular were anti-government. Right? Mm. So we have this idea that by virtue of their, um, the, their disliking government regulations in the realm of say labor practices, that they are the most anti-state form of capitalism that exists. To the contrary, um, throughout the 20th century, the Interior Department is one among other actors that have been incredibly helpful to American companies in curtailing risk of investment, especially in uncharted zones, in yeah. foreign zones, or in what they always referred to as virgin land. So this kind of um, expanding frontier mentality is one that brings together public and private entities that have an uncomfortable and never perfectly harmonious and never perfectly overlapping relationship, but that very consistently have a shared assumption that the one role that government should have is promoting capitalism in new zones of investment. Mm -hmm. I, I have a, um, quite a long question. I'll read it out in a second from Ruth Rand, who's one of our okay. post fellows at the moment. And you probably know she works okay. on space junk and um, yes. uh, from an environmental history perspective. So mm -hmm. she's taken your, your um, call to um, take environmental history global even even further. Absolutely. But also perspective two of the of national sovereignty, which has definitely got some resonances with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so let me read out what she said. She wants you to speak a bit more directly about how Neil Meyer's work, Meyer's mm. work, on mm -hmm. land Soviet counterpart into cosmos might either be in concert or conflict with your mm -hmm. assessment of the first decade mm -hmm. of Lands. So he mm -hmm. characterized Landsat and into cosmos as not just tools of colonial resource prospecting, mm -hmm. but also yeah. as tools by which both superpowers attempted to expand their spheres of influence for information. Mm -hmm nations that did not have access to Earth data from satellites. Mm -hmm. There's also Great. tension between Interior, NASA and the DOD mm -hmm. as satellite operators in terms of how satellites were received or resisted domestically and elsewhere as tools of hegemony or tools of friendship. So mm -hmm. she'd love to hear if you've explored this at all in your work. Yes, so in the kind of deeper um, like footnote in component of the written version of the work, Neil's work is very important as a kind of um, example of taking seriously Landsat as the environmental mission that many of its proponents loudly um, offered to various publics. And it's, it is um, the case that I, I do have a kind of disagreement um, with the extent to which this tool is one that is allows for an anti-colonial politics. So 
Neil, for example, sees the kind of creation of the creation or the creation of ground stations in places like Brazil and India as evidence of kind of meaningfully resting the kind of means of control over Landsat knowledge um, and, and recentering it in places that would become the NIEO, the group of 77 and so forth. However, there is a problem with um, kind of it's easy to overstate the way that that evens the playing field and um, and part of how um, that continues to be the case is that regardless of their having ground stations, meaning that Brazil doesn't have to go to the Eros data distribution center in Sioux Falls, South Dakota to get that information, it doesn't change the dynamic by which Chevron can go to that same entity and pay you know the few hundred dollars worth um, for the images that in turn can help to um, really fix one of the key variables of risk in any kind of foreign investment context. potential existed beyond borders and to adjust their dealings with foreign nations accordingly. Sudan is one example where the first onshore oil well in Sudan developed by Chevron was actually um, based on decisions um, that were supported by the Landsat imagery that allowed um, company geologists to, to have a pretty good idea that there was um, something worth um, that could pay huge dividends to shareholders in, um, in the long run. So the, the problem here though, is that if you look at sort of voices coming from a more global South context, which are, are somewhat hard to access with the archives available, half of the scientists are incredibly excited, or, you know, of course, grateful or, or at least very pleased that there is a kind of genuine science and technology effort in the international development program. At the same time, there is a vocal group of opposition and even the representatives of the G77 from Brazil, India, and Argentina were incredibly upset by the dynamic that they called um, sensing states versus sensed states, a new take on have and have not nations. And they were trying to institute protections against this kind of uneven access of um, information about the resource potential of these, these countries. So kind of looking at this with more of a post-colonial lens, thinking about the gaze and the, the sort of the way that Western enlightenment rationality with this technology has, has um, created a kind of production of knowledge around the resource potential of another, um, another set of sovereignties and peoples is one that I think differentiates the way that I and we all look at this history. Though I, I absolutely agree that environmental ideas and projects are, are important to the legitimation of this in the same way that he sees Landsat as helping in the United States kind of post-Vietnam public relations on a global stage. Mm -hmm. So we have time just a couple of minutes for one last question. Um, I wanted to ask you on behalf of one of our staff researchers, Roger Turner, about the sources and how do you research the use of public goods and what are the challenges associated with that. So specifically, mm -hmm. he was wondering about which companies were using the Landsat images and how they were using them and how you got access to that information. But you could also mm -hmm. comment briefly on the broader issue of being able to um, access sources that um, those who produce them might not necessarily want to be out in the public domain. Right. Well, um, that is one of the greatest challenges because corporate transparency is not something that exists in the way that government transparency does from the, the archival standpoint. So much of what I know about the corporation side of it actually comes from their kind of public um, announcements about their founding of their lobby, where they brag about being one half of the entire user base of Landsat, which mm -hmm. from my kind of subsequent corroboration with what NASA was saying looks wrong. Like, I actually think it's closer to one third, but it is significant um, regardless when you think, kind of going back to Ruth's question, that the Landsat usership represented like the whole world. So the 150 nations of the United Nations were also buying Landsat images, but for of the entire user base, 
or oil and mining companies to represent one third of that base is a huge asymmetry that um, that becomes possible to see when looking kind of between public and private files, though it's very difficult to fix. Um, the corporations consciously tried to shield their strategies and at times refused to collaborate with NASA because they knew that doing so would force transparency. So they bought the Landsat images often through blinds and other kinds of third parties to conceal where they were looking. And they did so out of this claim that they didn't want other mining companies to know what they were doing. So I've seen in terms of corporate archives, like Chevron did brag about its Landsat technology use in some shareholder reports, but most of what I know actually came from government archives where through US aid and other entities, uh -huh. these um, collaborations had to become a matter of public record. So um, Chevron and um, in Sudan is one that you see US government officials really celebrating and championing because it's evidence that their kind of science and technology effort is working. Though some US interior geologists who were a part of that effort grew to be pretty disillusioned with their claim that the remote sensing technology was actually helping with the problems of poverty through resource development. And one um, interior geologist named Joe Morgan actually said, we should all quit kidding ourselves about the you know, benefits to the poor through these, you know, use of remote sensing. And a quote that's sort of taken out of context and hard to know precisely what he meant. But part of what I sort of see as being a possible interpretation is that he sees the dynamic by which those who are benefiting are elites and corporations and, and not the, the people who are mired in poverty in this moment that the satellite agenda was supposed to be helping through global and environmental resource management. Um, but as we talked, um, as we discussed, Daniel, I think that we have to get creative to look at archives related to corporations and things like seeing what their scientific collaborators have available is really useful. So files on mass spectrometry are ones that can bring together standard oil and reps and you know, academic institutions and maybe government collaborators and help us to see what the content of this interdependence really was. Megan, thanks for such detailed and focused answers to, to all these questions. There were a few more, unfortunately, I didn't get time uh, to ask you. Um, so let me thank you again, just on behalf of everybody. We'll have a virtual round of applause. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate that. I can. I can hear it. 